Hello. If you've never seen HBO's The Pacific, it came out a few years ago, you should. It's a very good look at a number of aspects of how the war across the Pacific theater was experienced. It addresses mental health, it addresses racialization, it addresses brutality and the nature of war, it addresses home fronts, coming home, that kind of thing. Uh, and there are a number of very poignant and very apt scenes that historians use today, even as a way for facilitating discussions about the nature of the experiences of war. Now, if you watch those kinds of series, though, and think of them as functionally 100% the clear and total representation of quote, you know, what you need in order to really get it. That's not going to help. Hollywood can give us a glimpse, a gateway. It's not factual reality. Despite even though uh, much of that series being based off of books written by those who lived it and experienced it at the time. It tells their story and their stories. It doesn't tell all stories and every single one. And it can give us the impression that generally it was just the Marines who were involved in combat across the Pacific during World War II. No, right? Not at all. There's quite a lot of folks who serve in a variety of capacities for the Americans across the Pacific during the Second World War. Naval operations aside, there's folks from the National Guard. There's the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Half of all who are seeing combat in the Pacific at that point are in the Army. So it's important for us to be able to recognize the diverse nature of how the American war effort deployed across the theater. There are Seabees. The Navy's construction, sort of in-house construction uh, outfit. There's marine aviators, naval aviators. There's isolated deployments on very small islands. There are folks stationed up in the Aleutians way back. There's folks at Pavuvu. There's folks anywhere that you can possibly imagine. In a variety of conditions, from conditions on hill stations in India to conditions uh, uh, where folks are grappling with malaria every day. Service varied across the Pacific, and so it's important for us to be able to acknowledge that. Now, when U.S. soldiers were not engaged, uh, and Marines were not engaged in direct ground combat, uh, they would be sent into staging areas, logistical areas, right, that kind of thing. And there were a number of areas where that took place, and the logistical process was a big deal, both, you know, in, in islands in the Pacific and across Asia, right? So you've got, you know, a number of uh, Americans, for example, who are in India helping to construct overland roads to be able to access things like the Lido Road and others. You've got troops that are engaged in R&R, &R. you've got troops that are engaged in the process of, of refitting, retooling, recuperating. For the Marines, for the 1st Marine Division, right, this is going to be in the Russell Islands, this is in a place called Pavuvu. For the Army uh, and for the Marines and others, Australia is going to be a big place for this. Now, there were difficulties here. Uh, the Australians didn't particularly care uh, for some of the, the cavalierness of the Americans. Uh, the Blue Laws on Sunday, they still wanted to enforce. They didn't like how the Americans were approaching some Australian women. Uh, and there were clashes. There were big clashes, uh, violent in some cases, especially by 1944. Uh, in India, right, you've got a number of American troops stationed there. It varies. It varies widely. Now, by the time you get to 1943 into to 1944, the Americans are able then through these places to project greater force. And they're undertaking large-scale assaults, akin in some cases to the size of what the D-Day assault would be in June of 1944 on the Normandy beaches. Operation Cartwheel, Taking with Ball, the Marianas, Invasion of Guam, Saipan, 
the Marshall Islands, the Gilberts, the Marianas, the successes that the Americans are going to have in the second half of 1944 are going to set the tone for what is going to come in 1945 and the shifting calculus away from establishing bases in China from which to bomb Japan, but to develop processes for an invasion of mainland Japan to come. And this would, of course, even include things like MacArthur's efforts to retake the Philippines, which occur in late 1944, the battle for Luzon, the battle for the Leyte Gulf, which happens in that October. Now, much of this, of course, the images of MacArthur returning are uh, you know, the I have returned are, are very propagandistic, to be certain. Uh, however, this was also a time period in which attacks against civilians are ratcheting up uh, on the part of the Japanese in the Philippines against Filipino civilians. Uh, this is a time period in which uh, greater um, violence is ratcheting up, right? greater casualties. Right. This is the era of the last battleship engagements. This is the time period of uh, kamikaze attacks uh, first being undertaken. So by the time you get to the end of 1944 and early 1945, uh, it's becoming more desperate. Casualties are going up. Uh, and the questions of where is the war going to end, how is it going to end, are starting to uh, become uh, debated more. Thank you.